Welcome. The, today's date is October 14th, 2019, and it's about 1.30. We're in the Senate chambers of the Kansas State House in Topeka, Kansas. I'm Joan Wagnon, a former legislator and one of the members of the Kansas Oral History Project. I'll be interviewing Janice Lee, a former Kansas State Senator who served from 1989 until 2010. 2011, actually. Oh, my. You, it was the beginning of 2011 when yeah. I went to the court. When, it, when you changed. She represented Senate District 36 from Kensington, Kansas, right in the middle of the state. North Central, yes. This interview is conducted on behalf of the Kansas Oral History Project, a not-for-profit corporation created for the purpose of interviewing former legislators, particularly those who served during the 1960s through 2000. The interviews will be accessible to researchers and educators throughout uh, the Kansas State Historical Society and the State Library and transcriptions are made possible by a grant from the Humanities Kansas. The audio and video equipment is being operated by David Heineman, also a founding member of the Kansas um, Oral History Project and a former member of the Kansas House of Representatives for almost as many years as you were. <laughs> so welcome, Senator Lee. I am glad to be here. Uh, today's interview is one of a series of five that we are doing with women legislators uh, done in cooperation with Washburn University. In the early 1990s, two historians from Washburn, do you remember that, came over and interviewed you? I had forgotten it until I recently saw the interview again. Yeah, and you were, I think, interviewed by Sarah Tucker. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a copy of Sarah's <laughs> report. And uh, you were brand new. Yes. And it was a fascinating read uh, because it talks about how you campaigned, why you decided to run, what motivated you, your family, and all kinds of things. So rather than taking time today to cover all that, we will simply incorporate this okay. in the record and it, it will be posted with your interview. So I tried to figure out how do I summarize Senator Janice Lee. You were married young. Yes. Farm wife with three kids. You finally got through college in about 1970 because took, you were I had handling three. the farm and the kids. Well, actually, we weren't on the farm when I went to college, but we had three children while I went to college, and so it took me seven years to get through, but I did. Persistence is, yes. is what I read <laughs> in that interview. Uh, you first ran for office in 1984. Uh, for the House yes, and laid your plans very carefully and so when Neil Arasmith uh, stepped down. No, he did not step down. You I, beat him. I beat him, yes. Uh, beat him well. <laughs> yes. Made the decision that I had decided earlier that I wanted to be in the legislature. I understood how it affected especially our local schools yeah. um, and many other things and felt that it was an opportunity that if I worked hard I would have a chance, and I worked very, very hard, and I was able to beat him. As you say, I, I got 67% of the vote, which was sort of astounding for a district that was a very strong Republican district. You had been a Democrat forever. Yes, Your always. families yes. were all Democrats. Yes. So it never occurred to you to not be a Democrat. No, I it? was a Democrat, and to be anything else would have, would have been untrue. It yeah. just simply would not have fit for what I was. Is there anything about your background that wouldn't uh, be covered in that interview that you'd want to tell me now? <laughs> I, can't, I really can't think of anything. I, I, as I talked in that interview, my family always was interested in politics. My dad had run unsuccessfully for the Senate. Um, and um, to me, it was something that I should do. You were supposed to, to provide service to your community, and this was one of my ways to do it. I can't remember if I said in the interview or not. Actually, my first elected office was to be township treasurer. No, that's not in there. Well, so I, I did not run. Uh, I got a call after the election by the county clerk, and the current county treasurer, or, or, I'm sorry, township treasurer had decided to retire, and so those three men who were on the township board at the time and their wives all wrote in my name. And, <laughs> and I found out afterwards that I had been elected with six votes. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty interesting. 
What we're going to do today, Janice, is talk about the 22 years that you spent in the legislature, your perceptions on what has happened with respect to policy, politics, and governance, because okay. I know you've been involved in all three. And I hope you will reflect on tangible policies uh, that were adopted, things that didn't get done, uh, and the way that you as a female leader uh, shaped your perceptions of government uh, broadly. And I'm also interested in uh, talking to you at the end about what you did when you left the legislature and went to the Court of Tax Appeals and since then. So let's start with the district. Um, what was the district like when you first ran? There were eight counties, uh, five okay. counties along the Nebraska border from Norton to Republic, and then three counties south of that, Rooks and Osborne and Mitchell County. Uh, so a very rural district. There were not any large towns. The largest town was maybe 3,000 people. Uh, so very, a very rural district. How did it change over time? The counties only got smaller. Uh, the district changed because I went through reapportionment twice. Mm -hmm. I knew that. And had, uh, in the end, I had 10 counties. And the only reason that it was only 10 counties uh, by the time that in 2002, the last reapportionment was because Ellis County came into the district. And Ellis County, while the other counties had 3,000 to 5,000 people in it, Ellis County had over 20,000. And that way, it was only 10 counties. Uh, so it became, it changed dramatically when Ellis County came in. Um, did, did you think that reapportionment was fair to your constituents? I mean, I, I know you had a big fight in the Senate over those districts, did in, you not? Uh, we did not the first time in, two th in, in 1992. Um, I lost Norton County and went down and took in Russell County and Ellsworth County. Mm -hmm. um, and that was fairly similar to what I had had before. It was a fairly homogeneous, brought in a little bit more of oil country that I had not had before. Mm -hmm. uh, but outside of that, I didn't feel that that was unfair. The 2002 reapportionment was the most difficult one, and there was a, a large push during that to actually put me in a district with another senator. And I ended up in a district with another senator, but it was a district that uh, I had some say in terms of how it was arranged um, and made the decision that I wanted Ellis County in my district at that time. <laughs> um, it's difficult when you're reapportioning rural Kansas. Um, many of the counties have a lot of similarities. Perhaps Ellis would be the one as probably uh, the you know Garden City area or the Colby area. Those are a little bit different than the surrounding small counties. I never felt in terms of the constituents that it was that unfair. The unfairness for them is that their senator, whomever it is, is a long ways away. Uh, you can't live in all 10 counties or all 15 counties. Did you ultimately move out of uh, Kingsley and into uh, Kensington? Kensington? No, we did, we did not move until after I left the Senate. Okay. Uh, we chose Hayes, quite frankly, to retire because we had a lot of friends in Hayes that we had friendships that we had developed during the time that I represented Ellis County, but also for the fact that it was closer to uh, really good medical services and some things like that. Yeah. Did the issues change by adding a, a density in a place like Hayes? Probably one of the main issues was uh, the university. I had, I had had a technical college in my district always mm -hmm. because Mitchell County had had the technical college and North Central Technical College was also in Ellis County, but the university became a part of the district. Uh, there were a little bit of changes in the interest, but not a great deal other than Hayes is just a bigger community as opposed to the really small communities. So how did you change over these 22 years, personally? Oh, goodness. Uh, I don't, I, I believe that I became a better listener. That's one of the things that you have to do as a legislator, is because one of the things that it seemed to me, um, I did every election year, I started door-to-door -door in May and did door-to-door -door 
from, from May until Election Day. Uh, usually started at 9 o'clock in the morning and went until dark at least five days a week. Um, and one of the things that, that I learned doing that was that people liked to be heard. You didn't always have to be able to provide for them what they asked for, but they wanted to be heard. They wanted, you, they wanted to know somebody was listening um, and gained a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge just because that's what you do as a legislator. You, you learn so that you understand the things that are brought to you. I remember at one point I had a woman who was uh, just monitoring what I was doing. It was actually a, a woman who worked at Johnson County Community College and she had taken a semester off. And one of the things she did was to come and spend some time with me. And she was so amazed at the number of issues, as you know, that you as a legislator deal with in a day. Yeah. And you have one phone call about this, this issue and two minutes later, there's a phone call about something that's totally different. And they all expect you to have some understanding. I never felt a need to do any polling in a legislative race because I felt like knocking on doors was the best polling that you get because people talk to you. Did yes. you feel the same? I, uh, yes, although we did do polling um, in 2002 when the district changed so dramatically and I ended up in a district with another senator. Um, we did do some fairly in-depth polling. Um, it did not show, what it brought to us was what I felt that I already knew from talking with people. And so did you run against each other? Yes. And who, I, what, who was your opponent then? Larry Salmons. Okay. So I actually beat two incumbent senators in my 22 years. <laughs> That's pretty good, Janice. <laughs> That's pretty good. You know, the, uh, the other thing that if I think about that span of time from uh, 1988 when you had the first election to 2010 when... When I retired. When you retired is that Kansas changed a lot. Yes, it and, did. And what we're learning in all of these interviews that we're doing is how much changed and what the impact of that was. So as a rural legislator, I would be very interested in, in hearing you talk about the changes uh, in people's attitudes, in their politics. How, how, did, how did things change in Kansas? A couple of things that I saw change um, that were fairly interesting to me, first of all, was liquor by the drink. Okay. When I was first elected, um, that just was, oh, people did it, but you just didn't admit that you did it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you voted for it, it was, especially if you were from rural Kansas, it was, it was gonna be pretty difficult for you. And I s saw that change dramatically um, uh, over the years, that was, a, a slower change than some of the other change. The uh, the other issue would be um, um, would be marriage and who can be married, and I saw a dramatic change in that from 2002 until 2010. Um, uh, gay marriage was just a, a very negative. Same sex marriage was a very negative thing. In 2002, but then by 2010, it became much more acceptable, and it just isn't an issue now for most people. It's just a huge cultural shift. Yes. But talk a little bit about the rural attitudes. Uh, maybe this is a little bit of stereotyping, but I always thought that the rural legislators that I worked with were very pragmatic, very down to earth, very common sense. Is that still? A, a true thing? Uh, with some and not with some. <laughs> okay, so. But how, yes, it, that, it, yes, I think that was part of, of what your rural upbringing was, was, was to be very thoughtful about things and, and not make huge changes, but have to have good reasons for why you did make changes. Um, one of the major changes that I saw that I find very disappointing is when I was first elected, one, you, yes, you were elected as a Democrat or Republican. I obviously would not have been elected if it wasn't for the Republicans who voted for me. Sure. My district was 67% Republican, 21% Democrat. 
Democrat. So I couldn't get elected with all the independents and all the Democrats. I had to have a lot of crossover. And, and people were willing to listen and to talk and they weren't in such trenches. And the longer I was here, the more I saw that at least the elected officials were not as willing to cross over and to work with somebody on the other side to, to get good policy. Um, and, and I found that in the beginning, once you were here, you, you worked with, a lot, I would work with a lot of rural legislators, Republican or Democrat, and most of them mm -hmm. were Republican, but that made no difference because we felt the same about issues. Our, we felt that our constituents, a constituency felt the same. And, and as time went on, that became more difficult, and I find that sad. Yeah, I, I hear that uh, kind of a comment from many people as we've done these interviews. Uh, just, just a couple more questions about change over time. What, was campaigning very different uh, in, in, say, 10 years after you ran? You, you in, in your uh, proposal here, your, your interview, you talk about coffees. And I oh. remember, Janice, you would drive home all the time. In fact, you rolled your car once. Yes. <laughs> driving home too late at night. I mean, you that, drove that, and that, talked that, and drank coffee. That never changed. Okay. I, I always, um, uh, throughout all of the 22 years, um, during session, I would have two coffees almost every Saturday. Maybe twice during the year, I would stay in Topeka on a weekend to try to get caught up. But otherwise, I would have two coffees every Saturday around my district so that I was in every county at least twice, if not three times during a session to be available to talk. And then all summer, I, I, I drove 47, 45,000 miles a year for every year that I was in, in the legislature, yes, because you had a big district, and to be available so that people felt comfortable with you. The, the, uh, the one uh, uh, poll that I talked about, one of the things they asked in, my, in the six counties that had been my district for, for 10 years, they asked how many people had had contact with me. And the people that did the polling were shocked because 36% of the people had, had had actual contact with me. And about 95% of those people were satisfied with the contact they had had with me. And they felt that that was a large percentage for a rural district. That's huge. And it's because I, I felt that was necessary in order to represent people not only did I need to hear from them, but they needed to be comfortable with me so when they had an issue, they would feel like they could come to me and we could talk about it. One of the things that we heard in, in another interview was that in the rural communities, there, were, uh, there was an acceptance for Democrats because there was a reservoir of goodwill towards Roosevelt and some of those kind of policies. But did you notice that the electorate got more partisan as you stayed in office? Yes, um, it did, although I still felt acceptance, but they, it got more, more partisan, yes. Although the last election I won by 60%, so it hadn't changed a whole lot. But that was, I think, because I brought in three new counties south yeah. of Ellis County, and I found it much more difficult. I found it much more difficult to make connections uh, in that area than I had ever found in the area north. And it may have been because I had been in the area up north so much longer, yeah. and then people were comfortable with me and moving to a new area. It was more difficult to, to make the connections. Sure. While you were in the Senate, you served on a lot of different committees. Uh, I had a two and a half page list <laughs> of all your committee assignments. You were on agriculture, uh, assessment and taxation, elections, energy, legislative educational planning, local government. In 1993, you became the ranking Democrat on energy and natural resources. By 97, you were the ranking Democrat on the assessment and tax committee and added education. And by 2001, you had risen to the position of assistant minority leader, which yes. is a post you held until 2010. And throughout that whole thing, what was constant in terms of your, your workload was assessment and taxation. Yes. And uh, natural resources. Yes. 
So uh, tax just had to have been a common thread. Uh, one of the things I remember from your earlier interview was you're talking about why you thought tax was important and why you tried to get on that committee. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> well, I, I can't exactly remember what I said, but tax affects so much of what we do. It af and it affects how we fund government, but it also affects all of the people. And to me, fair and equitable taxing is such an important thing for us to work toward. Um, nobody likes taxes, but they like the services that government provides. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, a, it's very basic to government is how we tax people and how we use those dollars. And, and, and I love the intricacies of taxation and figuring out exactly how they work and, and, and what's good tax policy and what's not. And maybe that's why the governor, uh, Governor Kelly, has asked you to be the co-chair of her tax reform commission. It could be. She knew my experience. And, and then, as you know, after that, I went to the court to the Court of Tax Appeals. And what's probably not in the record is that under Governor Finney, um, I became chair of the Use Value Advisory Committee. Yeah. That's when you were secretary, then yeah. later of, uh, became uh, uh, worked on the Use Value Advisory Committee for about 10 years under both Republican and Democrat governors dealing with the Department of Revenue and looking at use value in agriculture. And of course that is a huge dollar yeah, and cents issues to people who are in the agriculture community. Uh, yes it is. It's very important to the agriculture community. Well have your views on the importance of committees changed any? You were, you were uh, uh, waxing eloquently in your earlier <laughs> interview about how important committee work was. Well, I think committee work is very important, and as an individual legislator, um, that's one of the most important things you do because you help to form policy. Uh, and I and I found that having information and having accurate information could make you very effective in committee work. Yeah. Uh, I do remember one time that I stated something I thought was a fact in a committee meeting, and afterwards I found out that I was incorrect. And the first thing I did at the next meeting of that same committee was to tell people that what I told you last time, I was not correct. Because to me, your, your veracity was such an important part of being an effective legislator. And I found, at least in the, in the first number of years, that party was not that important in committee work, but your ability to be a part of a group and to work, work together was what was very important in how effective you were. I, like you, I spent a lot of time on tax committees on, know the, that. on the House side, uh, and I never thought that was very partisan work either. No. It was more connected to, uh, it was a giant puzzle for one thing, and a lot of times uh, connected to uh, just solving that problem and not so much partisan yeah. until you got down to raising taxes and yes. then, <laughs> then we had to push and shove. But then, that, then it became more partisan. But yes, and, and I found the same thing in natural resources. It uh -huh. was how do you find what is the best policy? And that's what I loved about the legislature and loved about committee work was learning to understand what's good policy for our state. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, the policy issues during your time. So um, we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, <laughs> you worked uh, with four governors, Mike Hayden, Joan Finney, Bill Graves, and Kathleen Sebelius. Yes, and Mark Parkinson. Oh, I forgot Mark, yes, who was, um, who took over At yes. when Kathleen went to the federal level, yes. Uh, two Republicans and three Democrats. <laughs> and some of the sessions stood out because of their productivity. That era from 1989, when you first came in, through 1994, when I go through the clips and read what the press is saying about all of that, um, there's just a whole raft of issues. Comprehensive highway plan, a water plan, school finance, 
classification of property, tax reform, mental health reform, prisons and sentencing reform, children's initiatives and the death penalty. Yes. <laughs> so you were there in the middle of all of those. Which ones of those issues were you involved in? And I'd like for you just to talk a little bit about your involvement with those issues in that time period. Of course, you were very much involved in the school finance, but I that was. was one that I was very interested in uh, from, from sort of an outside perspective, because to me that was so important for my rural schools. And what you all did with that formula was so dramatic and so helpful uh, to our, to our uh, rural schools in terms of the equalization aid and, and uh, moving away from local property tax to state income and sales tax. So that yeah. to me was a significant thing that I worked sort of on the perimeters. Mm -hmm. uh, water issues, did a lot with water issues. One that I remember that, that um, I did had a lot of input is actually now affecting Hayes and that is the Water Transfer Act. Yeah. And I was part of that. Well, uh, talk the, about that. Well, it, it we put in place uh, a, a structure that you have to go through in terms if you're moving a certain amount of water more than 35 miles. Uh, you have to provide to the, um, the Department of Water Resources um, the reasons why it's better to bring it to where you are bringing that water as opposed to where, there, where it currently is. Um, and um, one of the things that, um, uh, one of the parts of that is it, Proving that is, is the most difficult, is that, you know, why is it more important for us to be brought? The other thing is that, that when you take it from agricultural use to municipal use, you lose a, water, a lot of a water right. You lose about 40% of the water right. But that was one that I really enjoyed working in. Another one that we worked on in natural resources was, was brought to us by the federal government, but it dealt with, with uh, landfills and how we had to adopt uh, federal regulations and make them work in our rural communities in terms of, which was very good legislation, but it was very difficult. The water plan that passed in 89 was pretty dramatic. Do you yes. have any memory of that <laughs> very oh. fast ride with uh, Gus Bogina coming back <laughs> oh, from the I hospital? Oh, I do, yes. And, and I'm one of those that actually supported the plan, but I didn't support how it was being funded. And so I was one of the no votes. Oh, and, dear. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> and in fact, I had 21 votes, uh, 21 no votes until one of the senators who, uh, who had promised his vote to us, changed his vote. And that's when Senator Bogina then was brought in and uh, brought in by ambulance and brought in on a hospital bed. I remember him. <laughs> Literally, he was on a hospital bed in... Uh, casting his vote. In a hospital gown, casting his vote, yes. It was pretty dramatic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the water plan has been a wonderful thing. Uh, it's something that was very much needed for Kansas. Yeah, and uh, I remember a lot of angst within the rural communities when we started trying to resolve the school finance it issue, and it was a juggling act between doing what the courts said we had to do. It had to be equal for kids, uh, and and changing things pretty dramatically. Uh, did you get caught up in any of that? I found that my constituents were very willing to listen. Of course, maybe that's because I had so many public meetings and talked yeah, about it. Really do it, yeah. <laughs> and, prob and talked about it in depth. But yes, they were concerned about their schools, but they were relieved. Those who realized were relieved when, uh, the, when the mill levies went down dramatically as they did go down. Uh, not all understood that that came about because of the school finance, but some did. But yes, there was a lot of angst just because what's, our schools are such an important part of any community, but especially of a small rural community. Yeah. But you know, one of the most interesting things that I did um, as a senator, I had a, a young woman who grew up in Smith Center, Kansas, lived in Kansas City. Kansas City, Kansas, Johnson County, and she invited me to come and arrange for me to spend a day in Johnson County and visit with uh, their schools, Shawnee Mission and Blue Valley. 
and it was fascinating to me. One of the things I learned was how important the community schools were in an urban area, just as they are important in a small town. And the fact that if you have a community school in Johnson County, if that school closes, it affects the value of all the homes and that's in the surrounding area, just like it does in rural Kansas, uh, just with a different perspective. So many things were alike. But if you were working on use value and property tax issues, the classification amendment passed during that same time frame. It, it passed, the classification passed just before I came into office. But then my recollection is that it was a myriad of legislation to yes. implement it. Yes. We had to figure out what that meant. meant. Yes. And we spent several years passing uh, definitional things and yes. procedural things, which you got to deal with later when you got to the Court of Tax Appeals. Yes. Do you have any, any comments on that? Well, it wasn't directly, but 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 yes, all of all that we did as I was in the legislature, especially serving on the tax committee, was very helpful to me as the chief hearing officer and judge pro tem with the Court of Tax Appeals, um, because I understood the background of why different things were such ways, were, were, were a certain way. And um, yes, um, classification certainly came up. And <laughs> But of course, people don't come to the Court of Tax Appeals if they're happy with their taxes. And no. lots of times, it, they didn't understand why it was this way or that way. It was just that they were paying too much money. Yes. Who, what kind of interest groups were driving those issues? Like well, the, uh, the Farm Bureau. The, or... the Farm Bureau, the Kansas Livestock Association were two that were very influential in, in my rural area. There was a farmers union, but it was not nearly as, did not have nearly as large of a backing as either the Farm Bureau or the Kansas Livestock Association. Had you been politically active within the Farm Bureau? No, I had not. And they actually opposed me in my first election. But after that, they, after my first election, the Farm Bureau then supported me. I, I was one of the few Democrats that the Farm Bureau supported. In fact, one year later on, I got a, a, a state award from the Farm Bureau for some of the work I had done. Was it the Livestock Association then that you were active in? Yes, KLA? We, yes we were members of KLA, yes. Yeah. Um, I wasn't real active in it. My brother was very active. My brother was KLA president at one point. Because you had a lot of farming interests that were yes, going on at that same absolutely, time. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and and it, one of, another thing that I remember, and this is sort of a, a side story, but at one point when I was on the Ag Committee, and this was early on, the dairy people had wanted the state to put in place a dairy subsidy to put a tax on milk as a state subsidy for, for, for dairy farmers. And I, we had no state subsidies for any agriculture, and I didn't think we should. And I ended up being the deciding vote on the Senate <laughs> Ag Committee to kill that bill. Oh, my. <laughs> and Mike Beam, who is now the Secretary of Ag, the Livestock Association, did not support that bill. And I remember Mike meeting me at the door of the Senate when we left the Senate that day. And he said, I don't really have anything to talk to you about. But he said, I'm just going to walk and we're going to pretend <laughs> so you don't get inundated and beat up by <laughs> oh, That's funny. Because the dairy producers were here that day. <laughs> OK, now you were working with Mike Hayden and Joan Finney during yes. that time, because uh, she left in uh, 94 when, got, when Graves came in. Yes. Did you have any interactions with the governor's office or any, uh, with, any I, recollections about I, how, they, how they were helpful yes. on these issues? I, I, I was uh, um, met, I was one of the leaders that met with Governor Finney when she was governor and we would meet on Monday morning and go over with the governor what she wanted to have done. And so, yes, I, and now I didn't have as much with Governor Graves, but I did with Governor Finney. Okay. Uh, and talk with her, and especially with her daughter, Mary. Her daughter, Mary, was very, very helpful on a number of issues. First of all, getting the governor to be supportive, and then working with us to, to get things passed. Sure. Uh, by 1995, uh, brought about, I guess, by the 1994 election, 
The politics and the issues in Kansas shifted substantially, in part due to the election of a new group of social conservatives particularly in the House. Yes. Because I don't think it hit you it until didn't. a couple of years later. Tim Schallenberger was Speaker of the House, Bud Burke was President of the Senate, and the press reported many issues were debated, but few were passed. Abortion, extension of the lottery, and tax relief, particularly for car taxes, became central <laughs> unresolved issues. Governor Graves created a tax reform task force to sort out the tax issues uh, created by the previous time. <laughs> and by the end of the 96 session, crime bills and juvenile justice were passing, as well as they finally got the extension passed for the 35 mills. But you read the 95 clips, and they didn't do anything that session. They were just deadlocked. Yes. Now, you're sitting over here in the Senate. Um, there I, wasn't that kind of deadlock in the Senate yet. So, so that was all what was happening in the House. Yes. And at this point, I was gone. So I don't have much memory either. But what comments would you have on this realignment of the legislature along social conservative lines? Well, it, I believe that it, to a great extent, has continued through to today. It's much more socially conservative than it was in the beginning, um, except for perhaps the alcohol, uh, the liquor by the drink, um, uh, that did not continue to be as conservative as it was in the beginning. But yes, it had, a, it had an effect on almost everything you did. But did it track with constituent attitudes? Were those social conservatives reflecting what was going on in your district? I, or were they reflecting their own concerns about issues? I, I, I believe they were more reflecting their own concerns. I did not see that dramatic of a change in my district. There okay. were some things that there was a slight change, but I did, I did not see as much from my, my ordinary citizens. And, of course, there was a big change nationally. I mean, yes. that was Gingrich's contract for America, and there was a lot of change at the federal level. So I, I just, I'm always interested in how Kansas reacted to what was happening nationally and what was happening with what was actually some fairly clever legislative strategy to get a lot of different kind of people elected. Yes, and I think that's what happened. I, we, I, you saw that certain groups um, were that were socially more conservative worked much harder to get their people in line. And a lot of that was done through churches, which is one of the things that I found interesting. So in that 95 uh, to 98 or 2000 time period, what, what were the big issues that you were working on here? Now you're the ranking Democrat. <laughs> Oh, I would have to go back and look. I, I'm not good anymore at remembering what year we did what. Um, um, well, um, did you play on the car tax issue? Oh, yes, I remember that. <laughs> I think you were in the middle of that one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Worked very hard to... Uh, you and Marge Petty. Yes, to figure out ways to make it, make it a, if you're going to lower the the taxes on cars, that you lower the taxes on the older cars much more than you lower the taxes on the new Cadillacs. Because <laughs> the chairman in the House, as I recall, was a Cadillac dealer who then moved to the Senate, and his interest was in lowering the taxes on... Senator Donovan. Yes. <laughs> Remember him well. <laughs> on the fancy new cars, and we were more interested in, first of all, finding a way to make it work appropriately, but to be certain that uh, it was equitable between the new and the old, the expensive and the less yeah. expensive vehicles. Oh, I do remember that issue, yes. In 1998, Senator Dick Bond, who had then become president of the Senate, said abortion politics tied the legislature in it knots. Did. But the legislature also passed a record tax cut of $247 million by dropping the state mill levy for schools down to 20, 20 mills. Yes. Talk about those things, can you? Both that, of those issues. Yes. Uh, abortion became a very 
it, it always had been, but it really did tie up many, many other issues. Anytime you tried to deal with the health care bill, usually people tried to make abortion to be part of any health care issue and that you... You were always a pro-life legislator. I, I was a... Sort of pro-life. So, sort of pro-life. I was not a... Not a a strong an advocate of some, but yes, some, but yes. Um, and it, it was just inappropriate in terms of how that that issue was, was put into the middle of everything else. Um, and then in terms of the 20 mills, um, that was popular, uh, but it also made funding schools more difficult, finding the money to, to replace that. Uh, and not having the local option budget have to become so large, which of course was a very, very detrimental to the rural areas. And, and um, lowering at one point during that time, the amount of state support to the local option budget was also lowered. It was not kept at the level that it was supposed to, uh, which made it. Was that perhaps uh, that, when it was at 35 mills, 35 mills was a, an average of what the tax load would have been statewide. Yes. When you drop it to 20, you're, you're having to put a lot more sales, a lot more income tax in. Uh, was that when we started underfunding schools and got yes. in trouble with the I think the it courts? was. And the, and the other thing we did, though, was, was we allowed the local option budget to increase, too, yeah. at that time, which helped a little bit, but it also made it disequal for rural schools or for poor schools. It wouldn't be just rural. It would be poor schools. Wyandotte County was one right. as well. Yes. Right. The urban schools in some of the rural areas. Yes. Yes. And, uh, yeah. And equalization and, was But it. yes, that, that's when I believe that we began to have trouble, more trouble with the courts in, in terms of not funding appropriately. Now, Bill Graves is governor. So he comes in in 94 and he's got to deal with all these other issues and these social <laughs> conservatives. But by, and he was not. No. But by 99, the leaders again are calling the session historic because they funded a second 10-year transportation plan, yes. two-year funding of schools, including an increase in base state aid, and restructured the governance of higher education. I think those are are big issues. Yes. Do you agree? Yes, and I helped with the restructuring of higher ed. That's something that I always worked very strongly on because I had a technical college in my in my mm -hmm. district. And we at those times they were before that time they were called technical schools and people did not want to send their kids to school when they graduate from high school. They wanted to send them to college. Dennis McKinney was another one that we worked very hard on this together um, and got it so that technical colleges could become colleges if they also taught enough of the basic tech ed or the basic education courses that they could provide a certificate like a two-year community college could provide. Yeah. And, that, and, and we also then restructured, and I think it was in 99, but it was in that time frame, we, we restructured the, the um, Board of Regents so that they had to have more uh, coverage over technical colleges. They had not been that interested in technical colleges before. And Reggie Robinson was not necessarily in favor of that, but we, we worked around Reggie and we got it passed so that the Board of Regents um, had more influence over technical colleges. Who were the leaders on that? Well, Dennis and I were two of the leaders on that. Sheila Fromm was in the middle of that, she, wasn't yes, she? Yes, she was to some extent, but Sheila was, was uh, she wanted to make certain that the community colleges could keep their structure in terms of their governance. Um, and didn't want, sh she wanted to have so that they could also teach the technical courses and get the support that the state gave to the technical class uh, courses because t the state at that time was funding 85% of technical education. Um, and so that could be also, that money could also be sent to community colleges. But yes, yeah, she worked on that as well. And Senator Emmert. Yes, Tim Emmert, we've, yes. We've interviewed him and Christine Downey. Yes. Both of them were involved. Yes. So that's a period where it looked like 89 to 94 was a very productive period. And then 94 to 99 was kind of a strange 
time, time with a, a lot time of, of cha change going on and changes in composition of the legislature and attitudes. But by the time you get to 98, uh, 99, and 2000, they're, they're taking on big issues again. Yes. Is, am I understanding that correctly? I, yes, I believe you're, you're understanding it correctly. I, I would certainly agree with that. But by 2000, then all of a sudden, budget issues are hitting. Yes. And we started <laughs> running out of money. So every yes. time you give tax dollars away. Well, that's when you came into the, the there was a, a recession at the federal level. It wasn't yeah. as big as the one later on, but there was a recession to some extent at the federal level, and that, that made it more difficult. When there's a downturn at the federal level, it makes it you don't have enough money. But now in 2001, you became the assistant minority mm -hmm. leader. How, how many Democrats did you have at that point? When you came in? There were 18. Yeah. 18 Democrats. And when you became the assistant minority leader, how, how big? It was either 11 or 13. So sizable reduction. As strong, yes, a, a big reduction. And Anthony Hensley became the minority leader, mm -hmm. and I became the assistant minority leader. Um, how did your leadership role change your legislative activities, or did it? It didn't really change. I, I, I had more responsibility. I ended up on more interim committees. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you like committees, Janice. <laughs> uh, but it didn't change. I mean, I stayed on the same number of committees, and, and uh, it didn't really change what I did in the legislature. I was there to support our caucus and to support Anthony. Okay. And, and what was your role? I mean, you support Anthony, you support the caucus, but did you have something specific that you did as the assistant minority leader? I tried to, 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 to understand what the different members of the caucus wanted, what was important to them, and how do you, how do you make these, those things work together? Just keeping folks in line. Just yes, and and trying to keep the caucus moving together in the same general direction. Although we never uh, required people to vote any certain way, we would encourage them, tell them why this is a good thing, but also understood that if for your particular district it's not, then mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. Did you personally experience uh, or witness a party leadership election? that was influenced by gender? Did being a woman cause you to win or not win? I never, I never found that. Even when I was running for office, um, I had as many people say to me, well, we're gonna vote for a woman because men have screwed it up as, <laughs> as said, I don't think a woman should be in there. So I never found gender uh, to be a huge issue. Okay. I found it probably being a Democrat in terms of getting elected was more of an of issue. issue. <laughs> but then I think in terms of my constituency, uh, women f for a long time have been important in farming operations. Many times it's the women who do the book work. Uh, many times the women are out there on the tractors or the trucks or whatever. And that's what you did. You did yeah. the book work. You cooked yeah. for them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I never, I never found that, and I, I never found it. I found in the legislative process, and maybe I'm just naive, but I found uh, that having good information, being well informed, was what helped you in terms of what kind of influence you had. Yeah. I, I don't know that I disagree with that. <laughs> I, I think that was an important ingredient in, um, in terms of being effective. Yes. Uh, choosing leaders, sometimes I think people are uh, more cognizant now that we want to be sure we have a balance in a leadership team. Some women, some men, some rural, some urban. Did you experience any of that? Probably more rural urban yeah. than men, women. Okay. Um, personal, uh, these are the questions that uh, uh, we're asking just to try to track these attitudes about women serving in public policy. So this is a long one, just bear okay. with me. <laughs> personal identity is loosely defined as gender, age, race, class, sexual orientation, marital status, you know, whatever. Uh, did you ever experience times in the legislature where you believed that your personal identity influenced your ability to pass policy, work with fellow legislators, or provide constituent services. 
That's a huge question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. I think my personal identity in terms of my background mm -hmm. helped me to pass, helped me to get legislation passed. Mm -hmm. I believe that my personal background, my farming background, my rural background, my, uh, the fact that I'd been on my local school board, the fact that I'd been very active in 4-H, uh, the fact that I'd actually served on uh, three or four different statewide commissions before I was elected, all of those things helped me work with my constituents and gave, helped me with my constituents, yes. And they probably helped you with your colleagues in the legislature, yes. didn't they? Yes, they did. Janice can do that because she knows that. how to do that. She knows something, something. about that, yeah. yes. 2003, we're almost to the end of this. 2003 <laughs> to 2010 brought a new governor, uh, Sebelius Bash yes. Parkinson, with a new agenda. Democrats are outnumbered three to one in the Senate, two to one in the House. Budget issues in 2003 caused the governor to delay payments to governments. We did a tax amnesty, which I yes. remember, whole tax refunds, and uh, by 2006, uh, the, the economy had recovered and she was collaborating with legislators on a $500 million funding plan for public schools. Yes. So, do you remember those years? Oh yes, I remember those years, so, working with Kathleen, yes. What do you remember of the policy initiatives from that year and what did you get involved with? Well, I was involved in a lot of, number, a lot of different issues, obviously on tax committee, involved with any of the taxing mm -hmm. issues, on education, involved in the education funding. Uh, one of the things I do remember, um, one of the education policy issues that we dealt with, um, there was a push by the governor and some others in the legislature to increase the local mill levy or to allow, not to increase the mill levy, but to allow the local option budget to be increased. Sure. And I always opposed that. And I remember being in the governor's office for, for a meeting. <laughs> and um, being pressured rather strongly to support allowing the local option budget to be increased. <laughs> and I finally made my statement that no, I'm not gonna do this. I have, this is what I've promised my constituents and this is what I have to do. And at that point I got out my newspaper and started working on a crossword puzzle. So, so In the governor's office? In the governor's office, in the meeting. <laughs> because I knew if I didn't, I we might get into a discussion that neither one of us, none of us in there really wanted to get into. That was one thing I was not going to give on. It was, yeah. it had, it was something that I had promised my constituents and I couldn't, I couldn't go against what I had promised my constituents. And so. So 22 years later, the legislature has changed dramatically yes. in terms of composition. The partisan balance is different. The rural urban balance is quite a bit different, different. because populations have shifted. Partisan what else are you seeing? Partisan balance hasn't changed that much with the changes that have happened in the last couple of years. There's about 11 Democrats now, as there was when I left. I know, but there were 18 when you got oh, here. Oh, yes, it was a huge <laughs> difference. What, what, you know, the thing that I remember the most about it being 18 to 22 was that everybody's vote was important to your yeah. leadership, because all it took was two or three people to change and the whole policy changed. And so leadership, both sides, both Democrat and Republican, had to be more cognizant of what every member felt and what was important to every member. When it gets so lopsided, 29 to 11 or things like that, then if you're on the 29, you're not important. Yeah. They only need 21. Yeah. And so that's a huge change that I, that I believe has happened because um, when it's more even then everybody's vote is more important, everybody's thought is more important. It's become much more divided. Um, again, I remember when, when I first was here and you'd get, you'd get to the end of the session when you'd be on the floor and then you'd break for an hour and a half for, you know, because yep. you were voting all day. You'd jump in a car and it could be as many Republicans as it was Democrat and you'd just go someplace to a restaurant and you'd grab a bite and you were, you were with, it was a bipartisan group. Friends. And, yes, friends. And I always thought that was so good because you got to know each other um, and it made it much easier than working uh, when you were in the full Senate or in, in a committee. 
and, and I don't see that now. I didn't see that in my last few years. Yeah. When I was on the Court of Tax Appeals, I was here, of course, in Topeka full time, and I would often fix dinner about once every two weeks for Laura and some other friends, and there was one Republican senator who lived in the same apartment complex that I lived, and we would have her join us, and she always was glad to do that, but she didn't have dinner with Laura outside of my place because that was looked down upon by her leadership. Sure. Uh, that kind of, l just learning to be together, to talk about things that, were, you didn't talk about politics, you just talked about other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think that's sad when that's been lost. Yeah. Did the increased numbers of women, because the numbers have increased substantially. Yes. Every 10 years, it seemed like we've had a doubling until we got to about uh, 25, 28 percent women in the legislature. Do you think having more women made a difference? Yes. The women, I believe, work better together. They are more interested in finding a way to make things work yeah. together. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going into kind of a retrospective, and we're winding <laughs> this up. Uh, I didn't mean to keep you quite so long, uh, but as you look back on your time in the legislature, what are you the most proud of? That's I, a lot of years. Yeah, I'm most proud of the way that I represented my district, uh, the contact that I kept with my, kept with my constituents, um, of 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 the hard work that I put in uh, to be able to to do a good job to represent them. Uh, issues I'm very proud proud of the water issues I worked on. Um, I'm very proud of the education issues I've worked on, and obviously the tax issues. Um, sometimes we were very successful and sometimes we weren't. <laughs> but the times when you're successful, that really feels good. Yeah. So why did you leave? I left because I had the opportunity to go to the Court of Tax Appeals and because, quite frankly, after 22 years, I felt it was time for me to move on. Mm -hmm. And it's very, diff as you know, it's very difficult mm -hmm. when you're a legislator, especially like I was, for a Democrat from Western Kansas, the only one. It would have been very difficult for me to not have run again. That would have just been almost impossible. And I'm not certain that I could have won that next election, but more importantly, I just felt it was time for me to move on. Uh, 22 years is a long time. Yeah. I wanted to have time to spend more with my husband and with my family. For the 22 years I was in the legislature, the most time my husband and I had together were usually the Saturdays when he would drive me to some parade, because we were in 30 parades a year. And usually in, in the summertime when I was going to parades, he, he and I would go together if he could. The sad thing about that is I would get in the car and fall asleep and he'd drive. <laughs> and I didn't realize how tired I was until I left the legislature and we started doing things together with him driving and I didn't fall asleep. The other thing that That's was- That's pretty interesting, Jess. And the other thing that was most interesting for me when I left the legislature and went to the court, I would feel so guilty on a Saturday because I was just home. Yeah. And I wasn't going someplace to meet with constituents. Yeah. And it took me a couple of months to get over feeling guilty because I wasn't serving somebody on Saturday, because that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, for 22 years. For 22 years, yes. Uh, the changes in the legislature that you noticed during those years, uh, d d does the legislature work any better or any less well with other branches of government? I don't believe it works as well with the other, especially under the Brownback administration. I felt yeah. like there were a lot of, of relationships that were destroyed between the other agencies. And um, you, you worked for CODA. Yes. And uh, uh, was there any difference in working in a bureaucracy than working in a legislature? Oh, it was a huge difference. I wish every legislator could work in an agency. Because what I found was with the Court of Tax Appeals, um, those people were very interested in doing their job and doing a good job for the state. 
um, and it was it was an it was an eight to five job, and I got to go home in the evening, and got to have weekends to myself. But I I, I loved it. But it was very different, very different from the legislature. There wasn't the politics that there is in the legislature. So you were a hearing officer, hearing I was a, I was a hearing officer. I also was executive director. Okay. Uh, uh, they had done away with that position. They had, they, the court had married the position of, of chief hearing officer and executive director. Now, President, uh, Governor Brownback would never allow them to actually give me the name of executive director because he said that was holding two positions at once. But I did the job. The, the, judge, the three judges had yeah. me do that job. Sure. And, and then I also, whenever one of the judges couldn't be there, I sat on the court. Who appointed you? Uh, Mark Parkinson appointed me. Governor nice. Parkinson for, appointed me. Yes. And CODA, the Board of Tax Appeals, changed to the board several of, times, and it's changed back, back again. again. Yes. So, um, would you would you have done this again as Absol a young woman? If you yes, I would. It was, I it, it was a wonderful time. I loved it. The the getting to know you made. I made so many friends across the the state, and so many friends in my district. And and yes, I would do it in a heartbeat again. Uh, I'm too old to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. <laughs> but if I could do it over again, absolutely I would do it. It was, it was a wonderful time. And I'm sure after 22 years you have some advice for other women who might be planning to go into politics or, in, or serve in the legislature. What would you tell them? Um, to first of all to to get to know your constituents and to spend okay. as much time as you can with your constituents and then to study the issues uh, very diligently after 22 years i still found there were issues uh, things dealing with state government that that i learned new things that i learned and that was that was the joy to me was the the opportunity to get to learn Janice, you have been uh, a remarkable uh, legislator well, thank and you. a delightful interview. <laughs> is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to add for the record? Because this is going <laughs> to be posted on the Kansas Memory at the Kansas State Historical Society, and uh, who knows what else we'll do with it. Well, serving in the legislature was a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful way for you to be able to serve your community and to help move policy at the state level. And also, I would like to give a huge thanks to the Legislative Research and the Revisor's Office because they do a wonderful job in the support that they give to us as legislators. You couldn't do it without them. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you for your service to the state of Kansas. <laughs> Thank you. And you're continuing it because you're still working with the governor on yes. her tax reform. Yes. I so I'll be watching to see what you come <laughs> up with, Janice. That's a delight to get to be back for just a little while. It's a delight. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, this is Joan Wagnon, uh, and it's an interview with Senator Janice Lee from Kensington, Kansas.